I'm at a Ruby conference talking about business because back in the day when Rails just got started, I was Ruby famous. For, for whatever value of famous you want to say when there's like not even a book out on a thing. Um, and that's because I wrote some tutorials about the challenges that I had learning Ruby and Rails. I was formerly a PHP developer, the shame. Um, <laughs> my husband and I, Thomas right there, run a business, a product business. We quit consulting in 2010. And last year, our product business grossed just under three quarters of a million dollars which I think is not terribly shabby. Um, we have a variety of products. I'm gonna get my notes here, I'm sorry. We have, not, it's not that I've forgotten our products, I just forgot that I had notes. Uh, we have a software as a service called Freckle. Uh, we have a couple technical eBooks. We have a technical workshop that we run now and again. Um, we have a downloadable video course about HTML5 mobile web development. And I run a class called 30 by 500, where I teach programmers and designers, developers and designers, how to create a product that sells. Because it turns out that's actually what I'm best at. So this is going to be a demo. I do have some slides, though, because I feel like what I'm going to demo to you needs to be put in context first. And the context is, well, what if I needed to make $5,000 in two weeks? And that was the dilemma faced by my student, Brennan, who wanted to come with us to FunConf in September. Now, Brennan has a software as a service called PlanScope, which is really awesome and has actually been growing really well. But if you've ever run a subscription web app, you know that subscription revenue grows very slowly. It's very reliable, but it grows super, super slowly. So he didn't actually just have random five grand to pay for the flights a week before the conference and the conference ticket and whatnot. So um, he sort of set out a challenge to himself after I mocked him <laughs> to come up with the money, come up with the money. And um, I'm going to show you the method that he used to sell $5,000 of product with basically no ramp up time. And that's something that you can use in your product business or perhaps your product business to be. It's sort of a secret sauce. So the thing that I'm going to show you is the method that I use to read my customer's mind. Because it turns out, um, if you can read somebody's mind, you don't actually have to be very good at selling. And I'll show you why in just a moment. So let's say you need to make two grand <laughs> in two weeks. Um, that's a very tight deadline and quite a bit of money to come up with on the fly. Now, naturally, if you can just ask somebody for the money, that would be the easiest and smartest way to go. But if you have to earn the money and you don't have a client you can just bill for, you have to figure out how can you sell, make and sell something in two weeks. And it's kind of like um, being chased by a hungry bear, I think. It's like this is the bear of failure and it wants to eat you. Uh, so what happens when you're chased by a hungry bear and you need to somehow get to the goal of $5,000. In my head, this is like Frogger, but with bears and money. Um, so you're on a camping trip, metaphorically, and you have all this stuff, and you're like being chased by a bear. Do you keep a hold of your baggage or your backpack? No. You drop that shit because you are running for your life. And I think that this is actually a very good metaphor for business because in business, we are running for our business's life. It may not seem like that. But I think that that's actually the mindset we should have a lot of the time to make sure that we keep earning the money that we do need to do and keep serving the customers that we do. Not that I'm um, talking about working ultra, ultra hard. So this is the product that Brennan came up with that helped him raise the money and then some to go to Dublin. And if we think about that question, what if I needed to make $5,000 in two weeks? I think that this is not... Um, the most effective way to ask the question, actually. I think that we need to turn it around and say, what does it mean? All right. I didn't think this was one of the funny slides, but okay, I'll take it. <laughs> Literally, maybe you should have played man in the mirror instead. Um, if you think about, okay, you need to make five grand in two weeks. If you reverse that question, what does it become? that you actually have to achieve. The $5,000 is kind of a distraction. It doesn't tell you what you need to do. This question tells you what you need to do. 
how can I make a product I know will sell? Because if you're being chased by a hungry bear, you don't have time to dick around. You don't have time to make something that people may or may not want or to come up with like an awesome ability to sell, you know, ice to the Eskimos. You don't have time for that. You have to go lean, but not lean. Why did I say that? I hate that word. You have to drop your shit. Let's just put it that way. So how do you make a product that you know will sell? Well, you can make something that people already want to buy. Seems obvious, right? But when we ask ourselves this question, we tend to fix up, fixate on something. Because we're builders. So we sit down and we make stuff. It doesn't matter whether you're a designer or a developer or a writer. Um, you see the sentence and you think, thing, okay, I need to make something people already want, and want, uh, already want and are ready to buy. And we start thinking, all right, what kind of thing can I make? We start thinking about ourselves again. But actually, we don't have time to come up with ideas and then test them for whatever that means or validate them. These are ways to uh, solve a problem that you've created yourself. So what we actually need to fixate are on these other nouns. People want, ready, and buy. And I like to visualize them in this chart. This is part of uh, my class lessons. And these are the things that actually matter. The thing comes from these things. You don't start off by saying, all right, what thing? You instead go, well, what do people already want? And that leads to the thing. And in this case, it led to Brennan writing double your freelancing rate in 14 days. So Brennan followed this process, because Brennan's one of my students, as I said. And he already had this product. And this product, PlanScope, is a really cool, very different type of project management tool for consultants and freelancers. And he designed PlanScope this way as well. It just wasn't, it just took a lot longer. So with that priming, and to think that we have the hungry bear, and we have this chart, what does Brennan do? Brennan does the following. Brennan starts to serve, he fills in the people blank with people that he already has access to and knows about, in this case, freelancers. When you're being chased by a hungry bear, you're not like, I know, I'm gonna try to create something for people who are totally unlike me who I don't know. Because that's just, that's just a way to die and get eaten. Um, so if you have this deadline, this two-week deadline, and you know you're gonna, you want to escape the bear, you drop the baggage of what would be cool or who needs help in general and go, all right, who do I have access to already? Now, Brennan already has access to freelancers. So now we just have to fill in the other blanks. And then the question becomes, how do I find out what freelancers need, want, and will buy? And find out is the operative phrase here. Now, that leads to research. Yay. <laughs> no one ever gets as excited by this as I am. <laughs> so in my class, I teach a really long process called Sales Safari. And it's called Sales Safari because most of what people do um, is more like sales zoo. If you want to understand how an animal behaves, where do you go to look at it? Do you go look at it at the zoo? Or do you go to try to find it in its native habitat where hopefully it hasn't been disturbed or you know, intruded upon? Naturally, you want to go to the natural habitat because animals in zoos don't behave the same way as animals in the wild. They have totally different profiles, like pandas don't have babies. And you know, certain animals live really long and certain animals die really quickly. And that's what happens to your products if you try to build a product based on customer interviews. Because that's the customer in the zoo and not behaving as the customer would behave in his or her natural habitat. So if you're being chased by a bear and getting the data right depend is what leads to your survival or being eaten, you wanna make sure you get the data right. And so you go on sales safari. So where's the data coming from in this case? You don't talk to the customer, where's the data coming from? Well, Brennan had two sources of data. He had the information from his existing customers who had written in to him about other things. So he has this um, newsletter where he sends out you know, things that he's learned in his consulting career, because Brennan built a million dollar a year consultancy. So um, he would send out these newsletters and people would write back. He didn't say, well, tell me what you want, or like, what is your biggest problem? He's talking to them and they talk back. Um, and then of course he had the whole internet. Again, note that we're not talking about customer interviews here. Now you don't need to have an existing customer base to make this work. Uh, because you have the whole internet. And in fact, uh, you have Reddit. <laughs> so 
So believe it or not, uh, I expected people to laugh when I said you have read it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for obliging me. I appreciate that. When uh, I was talking to Brennan and asked, like, what data sources did you really use to do this research? He said Reddit. And I was like, no, really. What data sources did you use to do this research? And he says, really, Reddit. Um, because apparently Reddit has a really good freelancer category. So what I'm going to show you just super quickly is how you can use a resource like Reddit, which I call a watering hole, to come up with really, really profitable customer data. I'm going to show you a couple slides, and then I'm going to show you the process live so you can really see how I do it. Can you guys read all that? Great, all the, at least the blue stuff. So the first thing that I do in Sales Safari that I teach my students to do is to look at the headlines or topic titles or questions that are being asked and look for the significant words. I've underlined most of them. Now, you do this for several pages. I've only got seven items on here, but I would probably do this for half an hour or an hour. And then I would pull them out into a document, and then I would organize that document. And I would, that's my keywords and my themes here. And you'll notice that certain words or certain um, categories come up again and again. And I only did this on two pages of the you know, top items on, on Reddit Freelance. And that gives us an amazing place to start to dig even deeper. So you have your list of topics, you have your keywords, and then you start searching, and then you pull up individual threads, and then you read the individual threads, and you look for the valuable veins of data that you can use to come up with something that people already need and want and are ready to buy. Now, there's, there's more to it than this, and you can't just base everything off Reddit. Unfortunately, we only have you know, a limited amount of time today, and I'm sure everybody's tired, so I won't tell you about all the steps of the process. One of them involves seeing if they actually buy things and if there's actually people on the watering hole on a regular basis. So Brennan did all this research and he gathered it and he took these steps and he came up with a chart that looks kind of like this. So he's going to serve freelancers, that's who, that's the people, and what do they um, want or need or like what is hurting them currently. Um, and they want to raise their rates or they think they ought to, uh, but they're scared to do it. They don't know how. Um, what they want is to know exactly how to do it and what they might be interested in buying would be a guide exactly how to do it. They know that there's information out there, general information like, you should raise your rates. They are suspect they ought to be doing it, but they haven't done it. And why? Brennan uh, came to the conclusion it was because they didn't have a very detailed step-by-step -step guide, and that is what double your freelancing rate in 14 days is. And that's how he was able to actually pre-sell something like $7,000 worth of it really quickly, he got to go to Dublin. Um, and I don't have the latest numbers on his sales total, but he's definitely crossed the $20,000 mark on this thing. And by the way, it's, he did about half of that in pre-sales. It's about 50 pages long, and people are writing him every week about how he's helped them earn so much more money. All because he did this research based on what people wrote back to him about their concerns, sort of Naturally, he didn't ask them, what's your number one concern? Because that, that doesn't get you good data. He, he went and saw what people were doing naturally without his prompting, and he made really good notes, and he looked for trends, and he came up with the fact that they're scared, but they wish they weren't scared, of course. They wish they earned more money, and that they could use the hand-holding. And that way, he um, escaped the hungry bear. So now I'm actually going to show this to you semi-live. i turn the mirroring back on. So here's my W get in Reddit, freelance specifically, not general Reddit. <laughs> if you can find valuable data in general Reddit, I commend you. So um, is there any way, is this the highest resolution that this does? Oh, exciting. All right, let me open my little notepad and Screen is so tiny. Oh my god, don't look at all my tabs. All right. So I'm going to look, somehow I'm going to find all the nouns here. So here's what I see. I see. If 
I see a word twice, I'll do little hash marks. I really don't, don't make it complicated. Now I know, again, we're all really clever people here. We like to build things, that's what we do. So we look at this and we think, this is a problem I can build software for. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't do it, I'm telling you now. Um, because that will actually remove you from understanding the keywords and the, the themes and the trends. The whole part of this is kind of like installing software in your brain, um, not on your web server. It's very important that you touch the data yourself to get that feeling. All right, so client work on site. So long. All right, marketing. There's client again. Isn't this thrilling? <laughs> <laughs> There's client again. Noticing any themes here? There's client again. There's freelance again. And this is why I did a presentation first, because otherwise you'd be like, what the hell are you making us watch? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. But there's money in them narhills. Hours, paid. There's contract. Is contract again? Contract. It's really useful when you're trying to sell somebody something to understand what they care about. Because otherwise, how else are you actually going to sell them anything? Taxes. Contract. Work. Offer. Charge. Do we have charge already? No. So I will <laughs> do this for a while. I'm not going to do it the whole time for you. I've kind of faked part of this. Invoice. Client. Payment. So it's kind of like object-oriented programming, right? You're listening to the client talk about what they need, and you're like listening for the nouns. This is not necessarily nouns, but just significant words. And now I'm going to just organize this real quick. I don't feel like that. Da -da. There's no real rules for how to organize it. I'd like to kind of do it in general categories. Questions, ask. Things like that go together. Money stuff goes together. Hours, paid, contract, taxes, offer, charge, invoice, payment, dwala. Marketing is more of a topic like photography is a topic, processes, rules. So just Based on 30 seconds of organizing, we have some interesting categories here. Client is by far the most po common word in the title on the first page. So if we search for client, we're probably going to get a whole spectrum of information about what problems or questions these people have. Now, one thing to note about this particular subreddit is almost everything on here is self.freelance, which, oops, that was the extent of my W get. Um, which means that it's people actually talking to each other people as if this was a forum and it's not as if it was like a link sharing site. Almost all of the top stuff here is peer to peer. It's not someone wrote a blog post or like look at what this freelance company is doing. It's almost all questions also. So when you look into these topics, you'll find that people are helping each other and that is exactly what you want to see because you want to know, are these people interested in becoming better at what they do? If you go and you ask a question of an online group, that indicates that you're more interested in improving than someone who just kind of like, you know, dicks around or just kind of works their way through it. And the fact that people are then helping them indicates that there's a broader community of people who are at a higher level and who are also willing to give back. These are all healthy things that you want to see in a community that you don't see in general purpose Reddit, but you do see here. That wasn't me, was it? So the next step, actually, is to start looking into specific topics, which we are going to do. I actually, to save you time, I handpicked some or 
searching. I knew I was in the wrong place in my own process. It's kind of embarrassing. So I saved some search terms here. Again, I W-getted them. I have like 300 megabytes of Reddit on my hard drive. It's a little awkward. Let me open my search terms. So normally what I would do now is just cast a net. So looking at these keywords, it kind of gives you an idea of what's in the territory. And normally I would suggest that you do like at least three or four pages of topics. So you're gonna have a lot of words, like that slide that I showed you. Um, you're gonna have a lot of topics that you could start delving into. Um, and then you start searching for these keywords and seeing kind of what's around them. So if we search for pricing, this is the sorted by relevance, so it does, it's not sorted by date, and that's fine. As long as there's still lots of people talking on the watering hole, that's fine, and there's lots of activity there generally. So you'll see that people seem to have a lot of questions and problems about pricing. Raising rates, questions about pricing, lost a bid, pricing changes, uh, there's an FAQ, which has interesting stuff in it about pricing, what billing arrangements, clients not paying, all these things, lots and lots. There's just like infinite, almost infinite amounts of data. People talking about pricing, pricing rates. Do you show your rates on your website? How do you decide to raise your rates? Should you discount rates for longer term contracts? Look rates per location. Freelancers earning way under minimum wage. Um, all this stuff. First in person name price loses. All these things are people talking to people about their freelance rates. There's so much doubt and insecurity here. People don't know what to do, and they're looking for help. And that is how you know that you can insert yourself. Has anyone here read my really old article about help vampires? Awesome. OK. Like, five of you. This is 10. This is five. There we go. A long time ago, the Ruby community used to be really great. You could just hang out in a chat room and talk to all of the Rails people and all of the most famous people in the Ruby community doing all the most interesting open source projects. And then it came, became too popular for its own good and there was like a wave of people who would drown out all the people doing stuff and they'd be like, how do I write a forum? Now, is that a useful question? Can you help somebody who asked that question? No, but if someone says, all right, I have a contract and my client used up 20% of the entire hours in the first month and the thing's supposed to last 12 months, what do I do? Can you help that person? Probably, right? Because the person who goes like, how do I write a forum? Which is how I always read it. It's fun, it's more fun in my head, I think. Um, they ha are asking a question that's so broad, you can't answer it. It also indicates that they're unwilling to do like the tiniest bit of research to get started. You can't help a person who wants someone to do it all for them. You can help someone who, though, who's already made steps, but who's asking questions about with details and information and like, you know, a closed scope. And that is a lot of what we have here. Not sure what to charge a museum that landed me my biggest client. That's at least a narrower scope. It's kind of a general question or how much do I charge? How much do I charge? How much do I charge? What should I charge them? So you look at this, you see people helping each other, asking specific questions, giving details. They're actually out there going to get clients, so they're taking action. And that is what led Brennan to realize that he could help them more, more than just project management software. Now, if we go into some of these threads, now, normally, I would look at, I know, tons of threads. I tell my students that this whole process never really ends because you're always looking for customer data or potential customer data to make your product better or to make your next product or figure out how to market to people. If you can use their own terms when you market to them, if you can describe the problems they're having already, when you market to them, you're not gonna have any trouble making sales. So, oh, one more thing I wanted to show you. If, I can. if you go, <laughs> the screen is tiny. If you go over here to the sidebar, now this is permanent links that the moderators of our freelance have put up here. Uh, there's a frequently asked questions, links to for hire, blah, 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 subreddits. Frequently asked questions, and then there's a link to that video by Mike Montero, fuck you, pay me. So the fact that the moderators decided to put a link to this video, which is all about how freelancers let themselves get screwed by clients, they put that right there, that indicates a problem. Sometimes people don't say, I have this problem, but if everyone's talking about a video like this, that's kind of the inverse data point, you know what I mean? If everyone loves this video about how clients are fucking people over, 
you can extrapolate these people have problems with clients fucking them over, or they wouldn't like the video, or they wouldn't share it, or they wouldn't put it in their sidebar. So that's, some of you look like, did I, did I lose you, or are you just kind of interested in how I put so much time into thinking about Reddit? Hopefully it's number two, right? <laughs> so that's, that's a really useful data point, even if it sounds completely obsessive compulsive. So in the, in the FAQ also, look at the very first category here. The very first category is pricing. What does that tell you? That plus all our search results. It's very obvious now. And that's the thing about Sales Safari, about doing this research, right, is it leads you to stuff that's, of course, obvious. But if you hadn't done the research, it wouldn't have been obvious. Does, this morning, would you have thought that the number one problem freelancers face is what to charge or how to charge? Probably I would have thought it was getting work. So I opened up some, I saved some individual threads here. Um, how do you pick individual threads? I just kind of pick any that look interesting or that have a lot of comments or that have a lot of upvotes or that get passed around a lot, blog posts, anything. You don't have to use Reddit, and I don't even necessarily recommend it. There are all different kinds of places to find this data. If you follow people on Twitter or if you search for keywords on Twitter, that's always interesting. If you search for inbox zero, I think that tells you more than anything else about what people feel about email and what their problems are, for example. So contracting rates. What I would do now is open these threads and start looking for pain points. Now what's a pain point? The answer is you know it when you see it, like that um, Supreme Court ruling on porn, I guess. Um, again, funnier in my head. I always thought if you insert porn into a sentence, it immediately becomes funny. Porn. So pain points. You want to create a pro product. You want to be able to make sales right away, maybe even pre-sales. You need to serve them up something that they are ready to buy. The best time to sell somebody water is when they're thirsty. If you also happen to find them in a desert, well, it's probably unethical to sell them the water, but that's certainly the time when they would appreciate it most. These people have problems, they have doubt, they don't know what to do, and if you can help them, they will reward you with money, or at least karma. So there's two different types of pain that I see, generally. There's obvious pain, like I have this problem, my client is fucking me over, I have this doubt about blah. But the fact that they're asking, what are your rates? That's not just a question. Why are they asking the question? They're asking you the question probably because they're unsure about something. Maybe they're unsure what you're charging because they want to undercut you and steal your business. You kind of have to psychologize a little bit, figure out why. But it's sort of implied. Or if you see people just stating things like, well, clients will always screw you, that's the way it is. That's a kind of pain as well. They're not necessarily looking for a solution, but they're expressing to you that they think that life sucks. And that's a pain, certainly. And if you can say, you think that life sucks, but let me tell you, it doesn't have to be that way, and I can show you how. You can kind of sell them something, basically. You can help them and sell them something. So what I would do here is skim this. Uh, this guy just wants to discuss. Like, it doesn't sound like he's having any particular serious problem right now, but he wants to compare how do other freelancers price things? Am I normal? Um, is there something that I'm missing? And the first response is, you're not a coffee shop. You're an individual, a business partner, an expert with limited time to share. So this guy clearly has a different worldview than this guy. He's like, you're doing it wrong. Clients are buying your time. Charging more could price you out of the market for some tax, uh, tasks. Charging less could leave money on the table. Are you busy 100% of the time? And the original guy is like, yeah, I'm busy 100% of the time. So that's a pain point right there, even though it's pretty, it doesn't scream, hey, I'm a pain point, but it definitely is one. Let's see if there's one with a little bit more obvious. With any luck, my hellish four-month negotiations will conclude tomorrow afternoon. That one's like, ah, I'm in pain. One issue that seems to keep popping up was why the hell are we paying this kid so much? I think that's contributed to serious strain in negotiation. Normally, I charge a piecemeal rate, so no one knows how much I actually make an hour. I think he means a project rate. 
Uh, however, they insisted on an hourly rate, so I did the math and asked. My services ain't cheap, but they are absolutely critical and hard to find. So they hemmed and hawed at my heavily discounted rate, even though I told them if they hired a company, they would be charged 300% more, and that the very same company would in turn subcontract to me. We're cutting out the middleman, so we should both win, right? But sadly, blah, 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 blah. So this guy has a whole complex of pains. First pain, four-month-long negotiation. Who the hell negotiates for four months for a contract? Not good. He also suspects that it's because they think that he's a kid. That's a problem. You could then say, well, you know, I started out freelancing at 14 years old and landed all these professional clients, and I can tell you how I managed to overcome that problem, and you can too, which is true. I could sell this guy probably a class. Um, you, he has a problem where they insisted on an hourly rate, and he didn't want to give it to him, and his hourly rate looks too big for them. They, they were fine with the higher number, but now they have the hourly rate. They're like, eh. So he could use some information on how to counteract client demands like that, how to redirect the conversation. He doesn't know how to express to them how important his services are, that the cost of not using his services is massive. He could use so much help. And there are people in here helping him. Now, this is the kind of data that Brennan used to create his ebook because his ebook, How to Double Your Freelancing Rate, doesn't just say, well, here's how to set a rate and here's how to tell your clients. That information's already out here. What he teaches, because he saw so many posts like this, he teaches people how to completely preclude people questioning their hourly rates by completely changing the way that they talk about their services, the way that they set up the client negotiations, the way that they begin the project, the way that they, their website explains what they do. And that is what allows his readers to then charge more. It's not just saying, I'm raising my rate. He attacks this deep, deeper level pain that he found all over the place. People say, here's my rate. The client says, well, that seems awfully high. And um, then it just all falls apart. So he attacks it at a deeper level. And he uses exactly this kind of research. So what I would normally do is copy and paste various lines or write down notes like, you know, can't justify rate. Client doesn't like hourly, you know, doesn't see value, age, an issue, you know, kind of like stuff like that. And then I would do this for hours, and I can see some of you guys are falling asleep. Yes, it is boring. Absolutely. No denying it. But that's how my husband and I board our way to three quarters of a million dollars a year in revenue. So I find that exciting. <laughs> can inject that in your arm, wake you up. Does this make sense to everybody? Cool. Excellent. Well, that is, I think, as much of the process that I can fit into this time slot without everyone completely falling asleep. So if you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. Anybody? So back to the bear analogy. Or actually, back to some of the talks that I loved yesterday. This takes grit. This is not nearly as strenuous as a, what, 10,000 foot climb. I'm lazy. I would not be able to do that. Um, but the payoff is, of course, that you know you can do it. And then the other payoff is that you actually get paid. So, <laughs> question. Uh, hi, Amitha. Thanks for that. That's really, really useful. Are customer interviews any use ever? Because I, I know that the whole Eric Reese thing is about, and, and Steve Blank thing is about getting out the building and... I think getting out of the building is useful. Well, this is virtually getting out of the building. This is like if you could go to someone's house and like lurk in their living room and listen to what they bitch about, which is really valuable. Customer interviews, I think, are valuable. However, the key word is customer. Now, if you're using that to refer to someone who's actually a customer who uses your product, that gives you such a great scope for the conversation. They use your product. I use your product. I have this problem. That's really valuable. If you just go to someone and say, well, I think you're going to be my customer. Tell me about your greatest pain point. What are the chances that they're actually going to come up with their greatest pain point? Most people tune out pain. That's how we cope with it. So they forget. When they're on the spot, they forget. So they also want to be, if they're nice people, and you say, well, what if we did this for you and solved that problem? They're probably going to be more excited during the conversation than they would really be if they saw your product. So when you're talking to people who aren't really your customers, that gives you false data, I think. That's the zoo. 
But if they're already actually your customers, then their feedback about your product is something you should definitely listen to, and you should definitely talk to your actual customers, if that helps. Um, I was wondering why you care about sharing all your secret sauce. Like you have all these things that obviously are very useful to you. Why do you care about teaching them to others? And are you not worried that other people might use this information? I want them to use it. Um, this is the first time I've showed this off it to out, outside of my class. So my class, I mean, the last version was really long, too long, but $2,500. And the next version is really refactored and a lot tighter and costs more. Um, I found, one, I really am into supporting bootstrappers. I think it totally changed my life, and I think the world is better when we get to deal with more smaller companies and have personal relationships, and that smaller companies care more, typically, and that you know, developers and designers are my people, and I want them... I'm tired of watching my friends get screwed by big companies or feeling like they always have to find someone to pay them to do important things, or, man, all of my freelancing projects basically died. It wasn't my fault. You know, bureaucracy killed all of them. And that's really frustrating when you're a builder. If you do use this kind of technique and then you create something that sells, then you can earn money for doing what you love and helping people and you can actually ship things and have an impact in the world. And it's so great to get customer emails saying, you really helped me. That's the best thing in the world. And I want other people to have that. And also, I don't find that sharing this content for free actually it actually creates more students, I think, for me, because then they see that it's like not just like follow your passion and, and come up with an idea and then test it. Like there's a real s serious process here, and I think that actually makes people more excited to take my classes. So I think everybody wins. That was a really long answer, sorry. And Bass? After, after having built your product, would you go back to Reddit to promote it? That's a great question. Yes and no. So you'll actually, if you, if you follow this path on the real Reddit and look around, you'll actually find Brennan saying, hey, I actually addressed this question in a podcast that I did with Patrick McKenzie you know, two weeks ago, blah, blah. He doesn't just say, I wrote a book. He points them towards more free educational content, which people definitely want to see. And then that kind of slides into his email newsletter, which then slides into his book sales. Um, I say Safari never ends. I tell my students always be safari because once you have all this data, you also use this to create content marketing that lures people in, just like Brennan does with his podcasts and his blog posts and his newsletters. When you teach people something, then they trust you. I'm assuming what you teach them is good. And when you trust somebody, you're much more likely to buy from them. And then when you buy one product and it's really good, then you're way more likely to buy the next part from the same person. It's this awesome, virtuous cycle. And this data is invaluable for the whole cycle. Any other questions? You can ask me anything. No? We're good? All right. Oh. Should you market if you don't have the product yet? You said, should you market if you don't have a product yet? Well, that depends. So Brennan actually made pre-sales of his product. I've made pre-sales of some of my products as well, um, where you sell it before it actually exists. However, at that point, we both had a very clear idea of what the product would be, what pains did it solve, for whom, how would we market it? And so if you know where you're going based on the research and you have a good idea, then absolutely, market before. And then when you launch it, you can either do pre-sales or you can launch it to a list of customers who are already interested. And uh, we use that technique kind of awkwardly to launch uh, Freckle back in 2008. And so the very first month that we had billing, uh, we did like 1,500 or so in sales for the very first month, which was a great way to start off. Uh, what data shouldn't you gather, and what shouldn't you do with the good data you get? Well, what data shouldn't you gather? No one has ever asked me that before. I'm more of the mind that you want all the data. 
I love data. I'm a nerd, so I'm inclined to think that data is good. But I wouldn't. <clears throat> right. That's 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 a good way to set up the question. So you have to you want data that's naturally occurring. When you interview a customer who's not actually a customer, you interview a person you want to sell to, um, that can be bad data because of all the reasons I said. This data is all naturally occurring, so that's good. But if you, if you go and you find where people are hanging out and talking about their problems, but it hasn't been posted to in a year, or it's all spam, that's a sign that that data is not trustworthy. You have to look for like signs of data health. And certainly you don't want to record every single word. If you just copy and paste this into a file and save it, that's not in a usable form. You want to look through this and process it in your brain and write it down, but also then you'll have it back in your mind and you can use that. So you don't want to be, you also don't want to do this for like six months before you do anything, if that helps. And don't, don't be evil, because if you are, you, you know, you won't get that virtuous cycle because you can only trick people so many times. Hey, so Reddit seems like a very good place to do this kind of research. Do you have any other places that you can recommend for doing that kind of research too? Great question. So it depends on your audience. So if I were going to do Ruby developers or JavaScript developers, I would definitely look at Stack Overflow. I would look at mailing lists. I would look at GitHub uh, issues for the top open source projects. I would look at the forum support forums for open source tools. Um, I would look on Twitter. Do Rubyists hang out in IRC anymore? I don't know, but if so, I would look there. Um, all kinds of different places. And all the different types of watering holes, like I just described, have different types of value. Like, people don't have long discussions on Twitter usually, but they often post annoyances. Like, when people say, yay, I had inbox zero, and you know all their friends are hating them right then for posting that, like, that tells you something. But when people also show pictures of their inbox and it's like a thousand emails and they're like, that also tells you something. It's not like a long involved discussion like this one is. So maybe you should weight that accordingly, but it's still really useful data. Like data can be anywhere. If you go to user groups and you listen to people talk about what their issues are, um, if you work with clients and you see that all your clients have the same questions or make the same mistakes, that's all data. The important thing is you don't just go, hey, what's your problem? Any other questions? Okay, I'll start it over again. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, so I, I was just wondering, at the end of this process of doing the analysis, most of us are probably, uh, you know, geared toward doing something like that, but we are really bad about, you know, knowing how to market uh, that end product and also, you know, setting up a price point for that product as well. So it's great to figure out, you know, there's a need there, but how much people are willing to pay. So in a way, it's almost back to the vicious circle of, uh, you know, how much, do, how much, what's my hourly rate? Right. Uh, you know, it's the same thing is, you know, how much do I sell this stuff for and how much people are willing to pay for it? So I'm going to answer your question in sections. Uh, the first thing about prices, what people are willing to pay, it's a real mistake to think that that's a fixed number. If I say, here's 30 by 500, it's a class about products that doesn't suck. How much are you willing to pay? Possibly $5. If I lay out all of the issues that you've struggled with and say, if you have these problems, this class is exactly for you. It will help you overcome this. It will help you achieve this. At the end of the class, you will have that done and ready, and you will be able to ship a product. Then how much you're willing to pay is dramatically higher, even if both times the product is the same thing. So pricing is not an absolute. Pricing depends a lot on how you package, um, design, and present the product. Marketing-wise, I think that content marketing, I call them education bombs or e-bombs because they go bam, um, is the best way. People call it content marketing. I specifically say educational content marketing. So if someone has these problems and you want to sell him your book, you can take one of the issues and address it really specifically in a blog post, and then you or someone else can say, hey, man, you know, 
that person wrote about this in a blog post, check it out. And then after they read the post and maybe think that makes a lot of sense or they try it and it works, then they're more likely to then want more from you. So this data helps you market as well. And you also conveniently know where people are and if you use their pain points to create marketing, then people will actually pass it on because it has innate value and it's just this beautiful cycle. Um, I do teach this in detail with exercises and you know, teacher review and stuff in my class. I think the issue that um, uh, kind of trips a lot of people up is they think, well, since this is a big problem, there must be um, there must be all kinds of resources about uh, you know addressing it al already. And what could I possibly add to that? So, do you pay any attention to other products uh, in the same space uh, when you're considering what to build? That's a great question. Do I pay attention to competitors? Um, people often don't believe like literally don't believe that Freckle makes as much money as it does. Uh, Freckle's our time tracking and invoicing app, uh, which I designed specifically to reverse the pains caused by all the other software that I used and knew that my friends also hated, and then I found people complaining about it online. Um, if you look at time tracking, it looks crowded. There's like hundreds of time tracking tools that are web-based, thousands, Thomas says, uh, but we're you know, it's the power law distribution. We're not certainly in the top five, but we're up there. Because honestly, I think that a bigger tool like Harvest or FreshBooks kind of creates the market. They spend all the money creating the market saying, you need to use time tracking. And then people use the software and they're like, this fucking sucks. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> come over here. Um, now, what competitors price is interesting. That's interesting data. And their support forms are interesting data. <laughs> yep. Go troll their support forums and see what problems people have or what they complain about. Um, which is, by the way, why we don't have a user, base, a user voice page. <laughs> so just try it on me. It won't work. Um, so it's good to know that there are people out there who are selling products. I think that's actually a better sign when you're selling to individuals and not to megacorps. If you're trying to sell to enterprises, don't. That's my advice. Because sales process, sales cycle, but when you have competitors like Harvest or FreshBooks or like even like GitHub or SendGrid, you know, these companies create a market or they expand the market, but they can't serve everybody. Not everyone will be happy with the same solution. So you again look for pain points. And you can sometimes, depending on who you serve inside that market, like freelancers, there's a whole range of people who are willing to pay a whole range of things, and you want to target who pays the most or the, who you like the most, that kind of thing. It's all kind of like a system. Every part affects the other, but I certainly don't think that competition should discourage you. In fact, I think that it says that you're not totally crazy, and it's just all data, I guess, if that makes sense. <laughs> So, I think we're about out of time, right? Uh, I've got one last question. Yes, please. If you can't find any competitive competitors out there at all, and very little uh, uh, specifically stated problems, do you conclude you're ahead of the time or that there's no market? You're either a crazy genius or you're wasting your time. I think that's the unfortunate reality. Um, it's very hard to create a new market the bear will eat you. Um, if you want to create a business that will sustain you so that you can grow as a person and have your own, you know, create your own job and all that stuff, you can't create a new market. I think that, um, well, let's look at my friend uh, Brian Helmkamp's tool, Code Climate. Does anyone know who Code Climate? Okay, great, lots of you, right? So I, that was the first tool that I was aware of that did what it did. However, you know that people are always concerned about code quality. Well, not always. The people who you don't want to punch in the face are concerned about code quality. So Brian didn't, Brian has a new product to which there is no competitor that I know of. Possibly there's enterprise tools. But he didn't really create the market because people are concerned about code quality all over the place. He gave them a different way to take care of a problem that they already had, if that makes sense. 
If there's really nothing, if you don't see by doing Safari that there are people concerned about this, then I would stay away until you have a nice big wad of cash that you're willing to kind of burn uh, while exploring whether you can create a new market or not, because the, the bear will eat you. <laughs> so I think that's actually all we have time for. Thank you very much. So avoid the bear.